Hey, yay, let's do it. Woo! Okay. Uh, this is a talk uh, called IPFS and Web Scale. How hard could this be? Um, raise your hand if you are a player of Elden Ring in this room. All right, cool. Good enough, good enough. So most of you know this is, those of you who play know this is the, the super hard boss, Melania. Um, uh, and so that's what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to beat this, the, fight, the, the, the final, final boss here. Um, and there's, in, in the interest of staying on brand with gaming, there will be some Elden Ring uh, images to go along with your presentation. Cool. Uh, who am I? What am I doing up here? Um, so I'm Hannah. Um, I've been working on IPFS for a minute. Um, I started working on IPFS in 2018 as a random web developer pretending to be a research engineer. Um, uh, I continued to do that and then moved over to Filecoin. Um, some of you guys might have seen uh, Lassie, which is like the universal retrieval tool for IPFS and Filecoin. I led that team um, and now I am uh, pretending to be a CTO at uh, Staracha, which is a new and uh, awesome company building decentralized storage and trying to make IPFS web scale. And then lastly, this is where, this is the important stuff. My partner, my, our four-legged daughter. Um, uh, yeah, so that's who I am. Um, and so this talk is a little bit based off of a little bit of a look inside of some of the internals of Staracha and the decisions we're making to try to make IPFS get to web scale. Uh, I'm a little anxious because this talk is a little bit technical and I'm going to be getting a little bit into the weeds. Sometimes that can become either boring or hard to understand. I will do my best. Um, but we're going to start off um, by talking about um, IPFS at 10. We are, we've just celebrated our 10 year anniversary and I want to talk about where we're at and where we're going. I want to talk about some ideas behind IPFS. I want to talk about the concept of data, data ownership. Um, and why it matters for, for uh, contra and address systems. I'm gonna get into this whole thing about indexing and separation of concerns uh, in building a decentralized uh, storage network. And finally, I wanna talk about the last mile briefly, which is web browsers and the challenges that come with them. So there we go, that's, that's the journey we're going on. So yeah, happy anniversary. We have come a long way. Um, Let's see, uh -huh. why, why are we stuck? Okay, yeah, so IPFS is 10 years old this year. How are we doing? Um, I pulled this from the ProLab Pro website. This is the number of unique nodes uh, that are, I guess, registered in the DHT. Um, you can see it's, it's not, not nothing, it's 200 and something uh, full-fledged IPFS nodes um, that are at least connected to the DHT, even as clients. You can see that a lot of them are clients. But um, those of you guys have interacted with IPFS for a while know that um, probably that is a very small por proportion of the people who interact with IPFS in general, because the vast majority of it, people who interact with IPFS are coming in through the IPFS.io gateway. I, couldn't find statistics on that, but let's just ballpark it at maybe one million uh, people interacting with uh, IPFS uh, every day. That's, that's a fair amount. Um, it's not that big when you compare it to the web though. 1.88 billion unique websites on the internet. I have no idea how someone tracks this, but that's the, that's the, t the statistic that exists. Um, but let's rewind a bit and ask, yeah, so we're not quite there. We're not quite web scale yet. But let's 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 ask what like what was web scale at ten, right? Um, so the web at ten years, uh, the the original like research paper for the web uh, is uh, comes out in 1989. So if we were to look at the web after ten years, let's look at 1999. So here are some things that we can see in 1999. So there was a Google, it said beta under it. Um, so it had just come out. Um, there were more websites, but 
wow, that puts us back in the IPFS numbers. Like, I don't know if you can read that, but like, is 1996 is about 250,000 websites, like our unique DHT nodes, and then let's be generous and say that we have, you know, like people, lots more people interacting uh, via, you know, the gateways. That starts to look like we have comparable numbers. And then this is one that I think is really interesting. HTTP 1.1. So this is actually the HTTP that almost all of us know, know and love who did web development. This is where REST comes from. Uh, this is where, this is basically the foundation for uh, JSON APIs. All of it, it starts with the HTTP 1.1 and that, uh, that, that specification actually came out in 1999. So it's interesting that, that what we think of as the sort of standard web was actually an innovation that appeared 10 years after the, the, um, the original idea of uh, the internet. So yeah, cool, awesome. So I wanna talk about good ideas uh, and how and, and what, what, what they can create, right? Um, uh, come on, go forward, okay. So I want to ask a first uh, one, uh, a question, right? So there's a lot of things we associate with IPFS. We have, you know, we have a lot of data transport protocols, you know, BitSwap, uh, libp2p, uh, I don't know, like you know, block stores, uh, you know, IPLD, whatnot. How many of the, what do you feel like are the big ideas of IPFS? And guess what? It's user, it's audience participation time. I would love to hear from you all. What do you think are the big ideas of IPFS? Raise your hand and you will get to participate in the talk. All the way in the back and then one, one from Rutger. Okay, I'm gonna run. Content addressing. Oh, yes, obvious, yes, that's a big one. Rutger? Yes, so in general, I think it's what, not where. So if you talk to a node, you don't care where the node is you talk. Uh, you care about the idea of the node, yeah. and content addressing is the same. Basically, you you care about what the content is, not where it is. So that that's kind of. A, but obviously, content content addressing is the main thing. Yeah. Wow. I, I mean, I guess we've. We have more. We have more. Wait, we got one more. Go go for it. I was just going to say more generally. I think it's also about distributing power. Yeah. There's a, there's there's a I think there's there's something there where there's like a broader aspiration to distribute the web in a way that isn't as hierarchical, right? I think the core technological idea of IPFS so far is content addressing, right? But I think it's really useful, that thing you just mentioned, the, the broader aspiration around distributing power, because I think what we can say is that, that so far, there's one idea that we've really like built upon and yeah, that got us 10 years and 200,000 nodes and lots of millions of users. And it is really cool. Um, why is it really cool? Well, let's talk about what, what makes the internet cool, right? So this is just the basic concept of the internet hypertext, right? The idea that you have one piece of content and you can link it to another piece of content, right? That's really valuable. It, 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 it allows people to access information in a way that um, it's just, yeah, you can you can start in one place and get to somewhere very different. I'm not going to justify the internet anyway. Uh, yeah, it's but I would argue this is the core innovation, right? Like there's documents, but like it's the idea that I can start in one place and keep browsing and keep getting more information that uh, is really awesome, right? But this is this is I think the underlying question that that that, that is beneath the whole idea of content addressing. How do you know the link is correct? Right? So, uh, oh wait, what happened to my other thing? Ah, oh, no, never mind. I've got my slides out of order. Uh, yeah. So, URLs are how you, how you address content on the internet, right? But they're fundamentally a hierarchical and federated model for ensuring content uh, integrity. And that actually comes down to DNS, right? So, when I access a link, is a correct link because I can access it at a URL and that URL is owned by someone who I've decided to trust, right? Um, uh, the, 
And, and this was intentional. Like if you go back to the early discussions of uh, you know, how addressing sh should work, uh, for whatever reason, the initial folks were very, very clear that the addresses had to be, like authority had to be delegated from a top-down entity such that like the only way you know, the only thing that I, the only way I know when I go to CNN.com that I'm getting the real article is by nature of the address and the, by the fact that it comes from CNN.com and then nowadays it comes with an SSL certificate that says someone has verified this is CNN.com, right? Uh, so yeah, content addressing is verifying the content in the link itself. Right, and, the, and uh, yeah, and so that leads to some different properties, right? Content addressing uh, URLs in their classic form are security through hierarchy. Um, uh, content addressing is a kind of horizontal security. The content is the correct, is, is, it is the correct content because the way you looked it up tells you that. <laughs> it's, it's built into the hash, right? Um, and this leads to a really interesting property to me, right? Because the URL, because the, the, the traditional URL is completely hierarchical, the data has to stay in one place, right? It can't move around because the only way you can verify it is by where you're looking it up. Um, and this means that content addressing has this inherent portability to it, right? Which is really awesome. And I think that this leads to a, a couple of different models with the, um, uh, between the way that content address, the kind of network that content addressing creates versus the kind of network that URLs creates, right? URLs are a completely ownership based model versus content addressing is kind of like this model for completely public and it's sometimes anonymous data, right? You don't care who created it. You don't care where you got it. All you know is it verifies to that hash, right? So that's a different structure for an internet. Um, the, the cool, uh, the one example I love with this, uh, there, I mean, anyone, anyone here from Spain? Okay, cool. Uh, this is a very controversial thing if you, if you are follow Spanish politics. Um, yeah, there's a region in Spain called, called Catalan. It's an autonomous region and they're often always trying to become an independent nation. Um, and they had a referendum uh, to become an independent nation and the Spanish government said that a referendum is illegal. So they put it on IPFS by putting a, their voting website at a CID. And the cool thing is, it was, since it was published on IPFS, if one copy was taken down, someone else could put another up. So there's like this obvious use case, right, for the the like content address data for the like we just want to keep things not censorable, or we just want to we and we also want to decouple ourselves from a specific domain so that our data can sort of stay in motion. All right, cool. Wow, this is awesome. I've got uh, so part two. Let's talk about provenance and why it matters, right? So data ownership, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Uh, people on Twitter have opinions. Uh, this is literally Jonathan from our world fighting over data ownership as of I think yesterday. Um, and data ownership has a, like a little bit of a connotation in IPFS, which is like, why are you capitalizing on capitalisming my IPFS, right? No, like it, it, it's like okay, we had all this free public data, and now you're saying that like people are going to own data and have control of data. And I would argue that um, this is not really a realistic uh, view of like how we all interact on the internet as humans, right? Like while it's nice to have truly public data that no one can control, right? We are like social creatures and information is valuable through our being social creatures, right? We are also individuals, like, unfortunately, like, you know, all of us need, want and need ways to express ourselves as individuals and we want to not have our expression completely, you know, stolen by someone else. Um, and also, like, trust matters, right? Trust is a, is a core concept that, uh, like that, that, that our interactions are based on, right? Um, 
I want to just make a point, right? Which is that there are there are super successful websites on the internet that are entirely public. Um, I put Blue Sky here as a replacement instead of Twitter or X because that's just a mess now. But like a public social site where everything is public and uh, Wikipedia, a giant repository of information that's completely public. But neither of these are anonymous sites, right? Every, everyone who is on these sites has authorship. Have, has they, when, they publish a, when you publish a tweet, it's your tweet, for better or worse. Obviously, there's consequences for that. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, Wikipedia, it's not like it's just a free-for-all. There's actually a system for the rights of, of ownership for the, the side of actually editing and writing Wikipedia. And you can't, you, you, it's very hard to build useful stuff with just pure, um, public anonymous data, right? But let's talk about why trust is, use, trust is useful, right? So there's a spectrum, I think, between ver pure verification, trustless verification, and trust, right? So there's this idea with Web3 that like, we don't need to know anything about, the other, about, about anyone on the internet. We don't need to trust anyone because we're just gonna verify everything. But that's actually quite hard, right? Um, uh, the example I have here, this is like our Jordan Belfer, like giving you a SID and there's 10 terabytes of data, right? If you, if you don't trust this guy, and probably you shouldn't, you're not going to be able to take this legit, this SID with 10 terabytes of data onto your hard drive, right? You need to, um, you're going to need to incrementally verify it. Right? You're gonna to need to take small bits and then verify that. And, and the more verification you do, the more complicated and brittle your system becomes. Right? That would be my argument, right? Incremental verification, we have some great solutions. There's also some really obvious problems you just can't solve without trust. Here's, here's an example, here's one that I like to go to. Like the, Okay, uh, well, actually, I'll get to that one in a second. So sorry. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's just problems that, that, that and fundamentally, unfortunately, mathematical hashes are pretty brittle, and there's a lot of limitations that you get. Um, another thing that's interesting about trust is that trust is transitive sometimes, right? If you trust one party, if, if let's say that instead of Jordan Belfort, this is your most trusted person in the world presenting with you with this data, right? You're probably gonna be able to take it all in and not worry about it. Not only that, but if you were, if someone were to show up and they had a, you know, and they had the, and they gave you this data and it said, you know, it had a little signature from your, from your, uh, you know, most trusted person, that you trusted, then you would probably trust that data even though it wasn't coming directly from your most trusted person, right? Yeah, so verifying everything all the time is hard. Here's the problem I wanna talk about, right? Same data, different ways of hashing it, different hashes, right? And this is a classic problem, right? Like we have like a Blake 3 hash for some data and maybe a Unix FS a hash of the Unix FS tree for the exact same data, and then you have the actual sh uh, hash that most people know or is most likely published on the internet, which is like SHA-2, right? This is a really tough problem because this is the same data, three different hashes, all verify the data, but how the hell do you verify that those are the same, right? Um, well, I mean, if you have the whole data, you can, you can definitely do that. But if you don't have the data and you wanted to maybe make some assumptions, it would sure help if like you got like the person who put, to, put all this together to sign all this and say, I assert that these are the same, right? And if I trusted that the person who had created the original SHA was the person who signed this, right? Then I could have some level of trust in the equivalence of these SIDs. So this is an interesting way that, that, that trust is useful. Um, in this case. So yeah, how, so okay, so we know that trust is important, we know that I author is, we know that we can't simply have a completely anonymous internet, we have to understand the concept of ownership and we have to understand the concept of authorization to operate on different resources, right? So with the traditional URL, which is a hierarchical federated system, you end up with this hierarchical per site authorization, right? 
And you get something like this, right? At the very at the very end of the chain is like this poor data owner who's like, can you please authorize me to some service, right? And then that service is like, oh, I'm gonna use these other infra services. And so it's gonna authorize itself to the infra service. And then maybe that infra service, you know, requires uh, further, requires another infra service to do some task. So it authorizes to that. And like, by the time you get to the top of this, it's like, who, whose data is this? Who knows, long lost, right? Um, and so you've lost that chain of providence. And now this, and, and meanwhile, like as the data owner for, for interacting with this front end service, my data has gone to all these different places and I don't even know about it, right? So if we have self-verifying SIDS, right? And this is our model for the content address web. Maybe we need self-verifying authorization, right? But what, but what would that look like? Okay, so there's this, this technology, you can. I think a lot of you guys have heard about it. It's in its simplest terms. Well, let's, let's, take, let's step back and take an example of a, um, a self-verifying uh, authorization structure from the regular web, the JSON web token, right? That actually, the, 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 the need for self-verifying authorization is sufficiently, is sufficiently great that even the regular web came up with a way with of, of sending you a token that proves on its own that someone is authorized to do something. So you can is in some ways a much more uh, capable version of a JSON web token. But since it's, uh, since we're now in content address land, we might as well go ahead and make it an IPLD data structure that can be serialized to any format. And this, and this IPLD data structure describes authorized capabilities and it's self-verifying, right? So basically the, the, to the you can token itself tells you what, says what someone is able to do, and it has within there the signature from the original person who would have control of the resource, right? And then there's one other additional element that's key here, right? So you remember the tree that I just described with all those different services, right? So if I, if, let's say that I authorize a service to act on my behalf, right? And now that service has, wants to, call some other service as part of doing what it wants to do on my behalf. What it can do is it can re-delegate part of its authority to another service while still having, while still maintaining a chain of authority, and this is you know, contained in the UCAN data structure, uh, that ties all the way back to the, um, to, the original, to the original source of authority on that data. So essentially I can say, like if I say I want you to do this for me, you can, you can then say to someone else, I want you to do this small part of that task on behalf of this other person. And what you end up with is a much different chain of authority here, right? You end up with the data owner at the top saying essentially, like I'm giving you the ability to take custody of my data in order to do a task to a service. That service might go ahead and call another service but in doing so, it's simply going to delegate the, the portion of authority that the user has given them to that service and then continue on to sort of subservices where it's delegating subtasks to other, but uh, where it's delegating subtasks, but it's all on behalf of the, the owner, the original data owner. So in this case, when you get all the way down here to these subservices, it's still your data. You're, there's still a record of who's the real owner, right? And then there's one other extension to this, which is like, so you can describes an ability. It's a very, it's, it's a self, it essentially describes a, uh, what you can do. There's a, there's a newer extension of you can that says, actually, not only can you do this, but I'd like you to do it now, right? Uh, in, I'd like you to invoke this task. Here's my authorization and here's my signature as I invoke this task that says I'm actually the one invoking it. Um, and so then you get end up with a tree like this. Essentially, you have your data owner at the top. You can say, please take custody, of, take custody of my data to do this task. And then you essentially have everybody asking everyone down the chain to do different tasks for the user. And then the cool thing about you can invocations is as each person finishes, they're sending receipts back up, to the up the chain that ultimately get to the user. And what you end up with is the user at the end has a receipt that says, here is an exact trace, essentially a trace of everything that happened when, I when you invoked this particular task. I think the mic might be off. I'm not sure. Okay, can you all hear me? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just keep talking loudly. Cool. So that's pretty cool. Um, now, I've noticed that there's a lot of talk of UCANs. Uh, I've been employing this meme a couple times uh, in these pre in my presentations. Um, yeah, you can's like really uh, kind of catching fire, I think. Um, but uh, and 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 that's super awesome. But I, I want to like actually like to me, we're looking at a world that emerges with you cans and content addressing. That's a, that's really interesting, right? The user owns their data. They can hire services to work on their behalf. They the services can hire other services for the user, but the user provenance is maintained, right? And um, essentially, this, this, and me, and we also have this loosened verification versus trust requirement. This starts to look like a much more workable internet than just the pure content addressing. So I have this bold statement, which is that you can is the second really good idea in in the the IPFS world we're building. So there you go. Cool. Okay, woohoo. So, all right, so you have this world. How do you build cool stuff within it? How can you build a web scale system within it? All right, so I want to um, talk about IPFS nodes and what they look like right now. So this is, this is your average IPFS, like this is IPFS today in, in most cases, right? You have some big, you, essentially you have one IPFS node talking to another IPFS node. And when you get down to it, each IPFS node is this big stack of services that are all bundled together, right? Um, at the base level, you've got the actual bytes of data, then you've probably got some mechanism via which you're storing them, block stores, cars, and then you have a whole other, then you've got like the IPLD understanding of that data, maybe even have the Unix FS understanding of that data. And then you've got all the transport layers on top, uh, BitSwap, Trustless Gateway, and then you maybe have the content discovery layers, DHT, IPNI, right? There's a lot of different stuff all bundled together, right? And, and you can see in there is a bunch of like you, you're gonna need some storage, you're gonna need some compute, you're gonna need some bandwidth. It's like all bundled together and each node has to do all of it, right? So how can we make this web scale? Well, why don't we go back, oh yeah, so just to, to show roughly, we've got a raw layer, a data layer, and, a, and like maybe you call it a retrieval layer, I don't know, transport layer, right? But they're all one, one application, right? So how can we make this more scalable. Well, let's say let's say we uh, go back to the original scaling solution of the the assembly line, right? Um, so if we it, the assembly line is essentially a recognition that you need to you need to have a separation of functions, right? Different resources you have different resources for different roles on the internet, or different roles that require different resources, and you keep each job super simple. And actually, we're behind on this because this has already been done on in, in the regular web, right? If you look, let's let's imagine a different form. And again, we can start splitting these out because we're gonna have various ways of using UCANs or other authorization mechanisms to allow us to operate these on different in different places. Right? The first thing that I would point out is that the vast majority of storage services on the internet are just pure, basically hard drives with a very simple wrapper around them, right? It's like you can read from my hard drive and you can read it at certain byte, byte ranges. If you look, if you dig into the storage services of the internet, you know, your object storages, your S3s, um, a lot of them, what they're fundamentally, if I, if I pay for that service, all I'm paying for is a hard drive, right? Um, and that means, and, and also some bandwidth. And that means that someone who's providing that really just has to have a hard drive and some bandwidth. Um, the other, and, and then what if we took that whole data layer of how we understand the bytes at the raw layer, what if we separated that out, right? And made that its own thing and just said, instead of trying to pack together, like as an example, if we have a file, instead of chunking it up into a bunch, into an entire Unix FS tree and then storing it as a bunch of blocks in a totally different form than the original file, what if we leave the original bytes intact and then maybe we build something else to help us understand it, but it's totally separate and maybe in a different place, right? Um, we might, we're probably still gonna have a, a, you know, the content discovery layer, and then maybe at the front we could call this thing like a retrieval, this is like sort of the, no, the, the layer that exposes all this to other people, right? You could say this is like a retrieval node or, and or 
actually that could just be a client because if you have all these things, you can get all the data, right? Um, and then I'm gonna call this for now, this like combined, how do I understand my, my bytes, uh, a content index, right? Cool. So um, this is, what does a content index actually look like? There, this is an abstract concept. You could index things in a lot of different ways. Um, this is a way that we are currently indexing um, in uh, Staracha. Uh, now, we, what we end up doing, we need to take in uh, data of arbitrary size, um, and we are currently still chunking everything up into Unix FS and putting them in car files. Um, and since we have to handle things of arbitrary size, occasionally we need to split DAGs over, over multiple shards. So we have this thing, we call it a DAG index. Um, you have your root, your root of the, the DAG and then all of the actual shards, which are the raw, the essentially car files, but we can think of them as just raw large blobs of bytes that make up this DAG. And then within each one, you're going to see like the hash of the, of the shard. And then you're going to also see, and then we also, and then we essentially put these indexes that tell you how, where each SID is inside of the shard, right? Um, and this is completely, this data structure is completely separate from the bytes that we store for, you know, for, for our actual shards. And you can, see, and essentially, you can see how you could use this to read out individual SIDs, right, within the stack. You can pull, you know, you can see like, okay, I know I want block five, so I'm gonna go into shard two, and I'm gonna get zero to 128 out of that shard, right? And that's gonna give me the block I want. And obviously I'll have to verify it, but probably this will be signed by the data owner, which again, gives you a little bit more trust and maybe willing to work a little bit ahead of verification um, so that you can maintain performance. And this is just like our 0.01, right, of, of this version. But you can imagine, you could actually do a lot of really interesting other things with, with the kind of index. Like let's say you wanted to do some interesting queries. You could store relationships between different blocks based off of like a pathing, right? So, so something we often want to do within our um, within you know in our queries is you know the canonical cases. If you have a Unix FS directory tre tree structure, you want to you know maybe you only know the root SID and you want to path into it into some directory, maybe an individual file. Um, and you could do it with that original index, but you'd probably have to do a bunch of round trips where like you're gonna have to say, okay, get me the root and then get me the, then read it in, get me a path, go down that path, read the next thing. You could also build an index that would give you that kind of information. This is just an example of like, you have a, you know, you could have a path section and maybe you have a, in that path section, you describe the relationships between different blocks based on path. And you can imagine you could put anything in here to enable all kinds of queries, right? Um, obviously, you're gonna have to limit uh, in order to make use of this. Whoever's doing the retrieval will have to be able to understand this and make use of it. But it's a really interesting idea is once you've stepped out of the idea of having like your structure uh, once you've stepped out of this idea of like your, your structure is encoded in blocks, you can describe relationships in all different kinds of ways. And I think there's some interesting ideas that could happen from that. Cool. Okay. So there's this interesting thing, which is you saw that these indexes are just a data structure. In this case, I showed you it in JSON. That one actually is encoded in multiple blocks. So you probably convert, convert it to a car file. Um, and all those things serialize to bytes. So actually, what you really have is just another bit of bytes, right? You have a content index, which is just some bytes. Um, and so now you end up with your retrieval node finding, instead of querying for actual shards, they're probably querying to get the content index. And then once they have the content index, they're querying to get bytes, right? Um, and so you've got basically reduced all of these guys here on the bottom to just hard drives. Um, now, for performance reasons, especially in our system, uh, we are probably going to have a re a, like some kind of a regional indexing cache. And what that means is that probably that that indexing cache is going to be responsible for doing like the, there's a number of round trips in assembling a complete indexing response to a given query, and we're probably going to have some caching going on on a regional level um, because that'll that'll kind of make the performance super strong. 
Cool. Um, and so then you actually end up with this is where we're headed in our design, right? These are all these bytes are what we call Sriracha hot storage nodes. They're just hard drives, right? And then you end up with, and then you'll probably have some kind of an indexer node. And then the last bit is some kind of a retrieval node. Now this retrieval node is probably for, for our purposes, a, an actual service running on the internet. Um, and exposing probably like a trustless gateway interface. We also expose BitSwap, right? But it could actually just be a client. All of this information is public and you could have a client that could read from these different services. Um, you just need a client that's a little more powerful, which gets us to our last problem, web browsers. Um, they are kind of a, a little bit of a challenging platform to work with. Uh, and this is going to be the, the slightly incomplete part of this presentation. So um, how do you do IPFS in web browsers? Well, we had a really good solution in 2018. It was to run an entire separate Go process in the background and maybe bridge it through JS lib P2P. And bonus, maybe if you're using a really obscure browser written by a homophobe, you can, uh, you could probably, I'm sorry, I did not mean to get that dig at Brandon Eich in there. Uh, uh, anyway, um, you know, like then you would have it embedded. Um, so yeah, like this isn't a great story. This is like a lot. And certainly like, it's not universal. You don't get it for free. Like somebody in the, you know, using your website, unless they've already done something ahead of time, they're, they're kind of like, um, you know, they're not gonna be able to use IPFS. Okay, so now we're actually at a much better um, place today. Uh, so you probably, you know, if you can just download some JavaScript uh, and maybe run this service worker gateway, I don't know if y'all, uh, heard about this uh, yesterday, but like we can now download some JavaScript that will fetch data and it will fetch data in a um, in a in a trustless form, i.e., in its original source format that uh, hashes to SIDS and then verify it itself. Um, well, that's pretty good. There's one little big thing. I actually want to ask the the sort of service worker gateways about this, which is the first load problem. If you use a service worker to intercept HTTP requests, really awesome solution. Just doesn't work when the page loads for the first time, which is like probably 90% of the websites you visit, right? Um, so that's not not great. Um, uh, and then there's a whole like I, I just sort of glossed over the 100k of JavaScript you have to download before you can do any of this. Um, that's kind of not great. Um, so we're not really there. Uh, just by comparison, and I'm coming from a perspective of a, having just tried to work with a, de tried to write a decentralized CDN and not fully getting there. Like here's the Cloudflare sign up if I want to use Cloudflare in my website. I'm going to redirect my DNS to Cloudflare and that's the end of my process. Um, so like that is a much, simpler proposition than telling someone if you want to use this IPFS in your website, you're, what you're going to need to do is first like change your website, add this big JavaScript, add that so all your users are going to be getting that. It, it's, not, it's not a great story, right? Could we have a better story? Well, it would work even better if the slide were complete, but the, um, there's, there's a couple things that we can look at, right? Browse, browsers have the ability, they have almost the ability to verify data. Right, so there's a couple of specs that are like, basically like specs that do a thing and that could just maybe change to do a, a little more of a thing and that would enable us to do some really awesome stuff. So for, so, uh, for those who don't, have never heard of it, there's this concept of a sub, of a sub resource integrity is one of the standards that exists in the web browser. Yeah, and it's like, basically what you can do is with your JavaScript or your CSS in your root page, you can put a hash for that CSS or the JavaScript, right? And the browser itself will not load that CSS or JavaScript unless it checks against that hash. So essentially it will do the content addressing verification for you for scripts and CSS. Unfortunately, it will not do that for images, video, I don't know, sound, anything else you got on the web page. And it won't really solve your, your, your it won't verify your first web page. Uh, load. There, there's another thing, there's another one that's in the mix. I believe there's like an integrity header that you can put in an HTTP response. Uh, also another spec that's kind of like languished. That one isn't even really done. The sub-resource integrity exists. It's in your browser. The, the other one, the integrity header, I believe is not fully supported in all the browsers. And like, there's like a lack of interest in pushing that forward right now. But obviously if 
people in the PL or, or not in the PL, the the IPFS ecosystem were interested uh, in pushing that, I think you could probably make some progress. Um, another thing that might be useful for that is if the browser crypto not only understood um, not only understood SHA hashes, but also understood Blake three hashes, because that would be the thing that could unlock some video. Right. So if you if you know how your browser actually works under the hood to um, to load video, when you put the video tag up, it starts making requests for that video, but it makes range requests. It says I need to get these bytes from this video. And now we're talking about partial verification. And this is where probably Blake three is your best bet for how you could get, uh, you know, verify verification of those things. Um, the other the other thing. Yeah, wrapping it up. OK, the only other thing I'll say is that that maybe we need to recognize that mobile platforms are dominant and also they're generally native as your basic uh, starting point and you have a lot more control when you're in a na native environment and you could probably just run that retrieval all there. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yay!